My name is Hamilton Staple, and I have the great pleasure of introducing our first speaker today here in Bancroft Hall, Richard Feynman. Dr. Feynman is a professor of cell biology at SUNY Downstate Medical Center. The original title of his talk was Fructose and Fructophobia, the Threat to Paleo and the Opportunity. I hear that title has changed and he'll reveal the new title during the talk. <laughs> Please join me in wel welcoming Dr. Richard Feynman. Well, the, um, the, the title has changed. The, um, the opportunity in uh, fructose was that it was, uh, a lot of the discussion was based on basic metabolism, uh, which uh, uh, emphasizes uh, the scientific uh, background of the problem. Uh, the threat, however, is that partly we uh, might not get the metabolism right, and uh, that uh, we're a little bit out of control in condemning uh, fructose, and uh, the uh, former mayor of New York thought we should even tax it, which would certainly have raised money, but uh, not clear that it would do anything else. Uh, so exaggeration is not good, but uh, in uh, taking a paleolithic viewpoint, there are probably bigger threats uh, in particular, uh, there's a uh, certain amount of pressure to uh, turn the country into what I call a carrot nation. Um, if, you, if you don't know the reference, I'll uh, uh, carry nation uh, was uh, one of the famous prohibitionists, and she went around smashing uh, whiskey bottles uh, with her uh, axe. Uh, but there are... Uh, actually many threats, uh, threat of red meat and uh, uh, even white rice. Uh, so I, I, as I looked into uh, the threats, uh, there was more and more material. I, I found myself like it, the uh, apocryphal story of a graduate student, uh, as I heard it in Berkeley, who was writing a thesis whose title was The Character of Shylock and the Merchant of Venice. Uh, after a year or so, he had so much material that he changed the title to uh, The Jew in Shakespeare and then ultimately The Jew in Elizabethan Literature. And uh, after some time, the title became The Jew, and he's supposedly still working on it. Uh, so uh, th there really are a lot of threats here. And what I would like to do is, is uh, to describe some of the problems in the medical literature, and uh, uh, the new title is uh, Hill's Criteria, Bayes' Theorem, and Murphy's Law, and Feynman's Matrix. <laughs> so I'm going to discuss uh, some of the original points on fructose and uh, uh, give you a golden rule for statistics to apply to the medical literature. And I'm going to describe uh, Bradford Hill's uh, Bradford Hill is the person who first made the association between cigarette smoke and cancer, and his uh, explanation on when an association uh, does imply causality. And uh, Bayes will uh, describe the philosophy of statistics. And we all know Murphy's Law and Nutrition. Uh, uh, if it can go wrong, they can prove it right with statistics anyway. And uh, in order not to be overly negative, uh, I'll try to give a possible uh, 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 take on what we can do that might Im improve uh, communication uh, in this area. Now, in, in fructose, uh, the key question, as uh, stated by Denise Minger's uh, uh, blog post, was whether uh, the fruits that we're eating now are like anything we ate before, and the idea is that we have not evolved to deal with uh, high intake of uh, uh, sh uh, sugar in the environment. Uh, 
And she showed that there, there really are a lot of sweet fruits that have not been through uh, uh, genetic engineering or Del Monte processing, and uh, that they are sweet and have a lot of carbohydrate. But the, but the real question is, it is undoubtedly true that the, the availability of carbohydrates, uh, specifically fructose, was much lower uh, for our ancestors. But the question is, does that show up as uh, an evolution of the metabolism for uh, low intake? And I would suggest that, in fact, just the opposite, that if there was a rare uh, availability of fructose, that finding a, uh, a berry patch for our ancestors was equivalent uh, to finding a coupon for Haagen-Dazs. Uh, uh, <laughs> moderation was not what was going on. Uh, so looking at the metabolism, the um, uh, basic idea that uh, was a problem uh, in terms of the science is the uh, emphasis on, this is the basic uh, uh, glycolytic pathway by which glucose is processed uh, either for lactate or in the TCA cycle. And there's an emphasis on uh, that being uh, different than how fructose is processed uh, uh, in the liver. On the other hand, well, what's said is that fructose uh, bypasses uh, PFK1, phosphofructokinase 1, is considered one of the major control points in uh, uh, glycolysis, and so it responds to ATP and uh, 10 other metabolites, uh, and so regulates uh, the flow of uh, glucose metabolites. Uh, the trouble with that is that, that uh, that's not a really accurate way of looking at metabolism. The idea that uh, this causes this and that causes that uh, is not how metabolism is really set out. Uh, it, it's more uh, what I call the uh, pinball uh, machine analogy, and uh, uh, that's really not an accurate position, uh, description of uh, uh, metabolism, because in fact, uh, fructose 1-phosphate activates glucokinase. In other words, the, the appearance of uh, uh, fructose calls for more glucose. So what, what has evolved in the liver is, is a, uh, a system for uh, taking in both uh, together. And uh, fructokinase uh, requires ATP. Um, uh, just. And what that means is that if you, uh, if you lower ATP, you're going to turn on phosphofructokinase. So the basic idea is that whereas it's true that a high fructose uh, intake will lead to the, uh, these intermediates, the so-called triose phosphates, uh, which in turn lead to fat and other downstream uh, effects, uh, the presence of fructose also activates the conversion of glucose to these intermediates. So the big uh, conundrum, if you want to ask questions about metabolism in fructose, is how do, how do the triose phosphates know whether they came from glucose or, or fructose? Well, they don't, of course. And uh, the further complication is because everything is connected, uh, you also have substantial gluconeogenesis. Uh, and uh, in fact, uh, up to 60% of ingested glucose uh, will be converted to uh, glucose. I'm sorry, ingested fructose will be converted to uh, glucose. So it's going to be very hard to sort this out, and you better be sure you have uh, uh, very accurate data. In addition, uh, although underemphasized, fructose is a major uh, source of glycogen. It, for a long time, was considered a glycogenic substrate. And finally, uh, contrary to what you may see on the internet, ethanol is not processed in any way like fructose. Uh, they're co uh, completely different in their metabolism. So uh, where does this uh, uh, play out in terms of uh, practical considerations? If you have a high fructose input, the, uh, uh, you do see statistically higher uh, 
uh, triglycerides, for example, uh, in the blood. But if you look at this, you can see that it's, um, uh, the differences are not great. And more important, uh, there's a, a very large variability. Uh, it's not clear that anybody in here is really better than anybody in there uh, because of the uh, huge error bars. The, the real problem with it uh, from a practical standpoint is that all these experiments are done at 55% total carbohydrate. And the question is really not, how can we maintain 55% uh, carbohydrate? Uh, and should we, if we do that, should we uh, put glucose in place of fructose? I don't think that's the question. Uh, but more important, um, this kind of data is not really informative. And so I'm going to bring you the, uh, uh, the minus one-th uh, principle. And that is that in nutrition, as in Lake Wobegon, nobody is average. Uh, and the new rule is habeas corpus datorum. We have to see all the data. We have to see uh, what individual uh, people. You don't want to know whether you're like the average. You want to know whether, uh, whether it's worth your while to bet on a particular diet. Uh, the, the zeroth principle, the major principle, comes from a book called uh, PDQ Statistics. Uh, it's um, a very good statistics book. Its uh, sense of humor is uh, somewhat beyond uh, uh, even PDQ Bach. So I'll just leave this up here but, uh, if you can read it. But the statistical principle that it says is that the onus is on the author to convey an accurate impression of what the data look like using graphs or standard measures before beginning the statistical shenanigans. And, and that's going to be the main theme here is that the medical literature is not uh, doing well on that. Um, I won't go through this. I uh, have a, a, too much uh, detail here. I, I misread the instructions. I thought I had 40 hours. Um, <laughs> Uh, but the, uh, the important point, though, is the idea of relative risk. And uh, it, it's uh, roughly speaking the same as uh, odds ratio or hazard ratio. And, and the way it plays out practically is if uh, the uh, odds ratio is 50-50 or the hazard risk is one, then, then there's no difference between the two things that you're trying to compare. Now, if, if the odds ratio is two to one, uh, then that's a suggestion that you may have something. That's uh, probably what it would take to be considered seriously if you had a toxic tort case uh, in, in a court of law. If, if you came in with less than two to one, uh, you'd probably have to have other evidence. Uh, I don't think it's cut and dried. So the main caveat is that relative or percent differences hides information. You have to know what the real risk is. Uh, as uh, one example I give is Alice has 30% more money than Bob, but you don't know how much money she has. They may both be on welfare. Or uh, I can give you uh, a good way of uh, doubling your odds of winning the lottery. You buy two tickets instead of one. Uh, obviously, that's not going to help a lot. Now, the. Uh, uh, so-called father of modern epidemiology is uh, uh, Bradford Hill. And uh, he, uh, uh, th this is a remarkable uh, document. It, it uh, summarizes uh, the question of when an association uh, could be considered causal. And it's uh, beautifully written and uh, very modest. I uh, uh, recommend it, uh, even though it's uh, 50 years old. Uh, that's Bradford Hill. And uh, as I said, what he asked is, in what circumstances can we pass from the observation to a verdict of causation? And he, he produced nine rules. He, he was very uh, modest and said uh, that it, was common sense. He didn't mean that they were absolute criteria. And the uh, uh, first of the rules, and this is what you should ask yourself uh, 
uh, when you look at any uh, paper, are we talking about something, big changes? Because his first study was to uh, get medical records from uh, physicians who, uh, because of their uh, jobs, were required to uh, uh, have medical records. And of the 789 deaths, uh, Richard Dahl was his uh, co-worker, and uh, 36 of the deaths were attributed to lung cancer. So when he went to look at, at uh, we counted smokers versus non-smokers, the correlation virtually sprang out. All 36 of the deaths had occurred in smokers. So that's the kind of data that will tell you uh, this is likely uh, causation. This is described in The Emperor of All Maladies, which is an excellent uh, uh, history of uh, cancer. So uh, let me tell you how you might apply, apply uh, Bradford Hill's first principle. This is a, uh, a recent study on the uh, Mediterranean diet. Uh, it, this is actually the most highly accessed paper uh, last year in the New England Journal of Medicine. And their conclusion was uh, that a Mediterranean diet supplemented with extra virgin olive oil or nuts reduced the incidence of major cardiovascular events. If you look at the data, however, uh, the data is presented uh, quite honestly here right up front. And you can see that uh, uh, there's a big difference between the uh, 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 control diet and the Mediterranean diet. But if you look in absolute terms, if you actually look at uh, the scale here, uh, this is pretty small. Uh, it's about 2%. And uh, the authors rather honestly plotted this on a overall picture. The hazard ratio uh, is 0.7. So that uh, the, the way to think of uh, hazard ratio given this way is it's the inverse of the, uh, uh, the uh, reciprocal of, of the risk. So it, uh, uh, 0.7 corresponds to, uh, or, or 0.5 corresponds to two to one odds. So they have not even hit two to one odds here. Um, but in, in criticizing uh, uh, these things, uh, one usually asks, uh, maybe there's a reduction in cardiovascular risk, but what about overall mortality? And if you look at that, you can see that the Mediterranean diet, one of them was worse than, uh, uh, just about the same as the control diet. In other words, there's virtually no difference here. And, um, uh, the uh, for analysis, I just added my own uh, uh, graphic. Uh, you, you really have to look pretty hard to find anything here. Um, so the, uh, the point here is that uh, Dahl and Hill didn't have to do anything at all. The, the trial that was supposed to be the most rigorous statistical analysis uh, required, uh, barely required elementary mathematics to prove its point. And, and that's, uh, I, I think, uh, a major point. If you want to get people to change their behavior, you, you have to get something real. Uh, let me uh, uh, turn to a, uh, another case, which is uh, uh, red meat and type 2 diabetes. and. Uh, uh, there's the claim that red meat consumption uh, caused type 2 diabetes. And uh, the most recent papers said that changes in red meat consumption, in other words, they had two different time points for uh, red meat and the subsequent risk of type 2 diabetes. Um, they came to the conclusion that uh, increasing red meat over time is associated with an elevated subsequent risk of type 2 uh, diabetes. Uh, and I, I'm going to try to analyze this uh, particular study in, in, uh, uh, as a guide to what you have to deal with in the medical literature. Uh, the um, 
when you look at this, the, um, what you're confronted with is rather than easy presentation of the data, uh, you see absolute mind-numbing uh, tables. Uh, so the question is, how do you get the information out of this? And what you want to know is, is well, what is the, what is the risk? Because, uh, again, the first principle is, is this a big risk? And uh, you can calculate that. Uh, the incidence, I mean, that's the simplest thing to ask. What is the incidence of uh, diabetes in this case, if you're a high uh, meat eater? And you just take the number of cases which you can find in table one, and I'm sorry, table two, and divide that by n, which you can find in table one, and you come out with 7.4%, which is something. It's not great, but you have to compare this to those people who didn't change their red meat intake. And uh, when you do that calculation, that's 6.8%. So the absolute difference is less than 1%. And uh, when you consider that this is a change, now, what that means is that they measured uh, red meat consumption uh, at two different time points. And uh, this kind of data is like uh, uh, weighing the captain uh, by weighing the ship when he's on board and when he's not. Uh, you know, you, uh, you're, really, you're really looking for trouble. Uh, Another way to uh, des describe the data is uh, to take the reciprocal of the absolute difference, which is called the number needed to treat. So what this says is that you would have to get 167 people uh, to substantially reduce their intake of uh, red meat in order to get, say, one person from type 2 diabetes. Along these lines, though, is the uh, Hill's next principle, which was consistency. In, in other words, uh, uh, does the observation fit in with everything else that's uh, been, been going on? Has it been observed uh, by different persons in different places, circumstances, and times? Well, it's been certainly observed by the, the, uh, the same group at uh, Harvard over time, but overall, uh, what most people observe is that uh, during the period that we refer to as the uh, uh, epidemic of uh, uh, diabetes, diabetes went up uh, substantially. The, the, uh, uh, the units are in millions of people, and uh, this is in uh, uh, pounds of red meat. So th there is a substantial lack of correlation here. And uh, nonetheless, the authors say, uh, our results add further evidence that limiting red meat consumption over time confers benefits for type 2 diabetes prevention. No, it doesn't. <laughs> if anything, it shows just the opposite. I uh, tried to do this fairly quickly. I don't want to put a lot of... Uh, uh, text on the screen, but the, the reason this is uh, uniquely offensive is that both the authors and the press uh, suggested that the risk in uh, red meat was comparable to the risk in uh, uh, cigarette smoke. Uh, my my uh, overall impression of epidemiology is it, it's the uh, correlation between uh, cigarette smoke and cancer is not only the classic example uh, but it may be the only example. <laughs> so what I, I wrote to the editor when this came out, and I said that the association is very low. And the author reply was that, no, it's not low, that uh, the 1.8 hazard ratio that they found um, uh, was the same as the ratio they found for smoking, which first makes you wonder why the paper wasn't called the risk from smoking. But uh, 1.4 is not high. Uh, the definition of high is not what you think is going to be a, a cause. It's what the number says. And uh, Bradford Hill found the death rate from cancer in cigarette smokers is 9 to 10 times the rate in non-smokers. And the rate in heavy cigarette smokers is 20 to 30 times. Uh, in addition, 
the important point is that he said that if you look at uh, the cancers that do associate with cigarette smoking, it's lung and throat. It's those things that you expect. It's not. And he gave the example of uh, uh, thrombosis, uh, where he, he said two to one was already suspicious. So uh, I, th I think this is a very uh, uh, serious uh, criticism. And uh, uh, I'm not finished with this paper and that, <laughs> and that journal. And then there's uh, temporality. And this is just a question of which came first, the car or the horse. And I, I won't discuss this much, except you do see a lot of reports about how uh, diet soda is associated with obesity. Who drinks diet soda? A really important question, though, is uh, the biological gradient. And what's meant here is that not only 20 times what non-smokers found, but the more there was a direct correlation between how much you smoked and the risk of uh, cancer. So if we uh, uh, go back to the red meat paper, uh, we have the, uh, we calculated the incidence for high red meat, we calculate for uh, small intake, and uh, you get 5.5%. But you should look at uh, what happens if uh, there's a decrease in uh, uh, red meat. And what you find out is that it's the same as high red meat. <laughs> so uh, what I did is I went back and calculated uh, the risk uh, 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 a dose response curve, and what you see is this. And what this is saying is that part of this curve is that re when red meat goes down, diabetes goes up. Now, uh, uh, I posted this on Facebook. Somebody said, what, what, what is the meaning of it going back up? And the meaning is that this data doesn't mean anything at all. Uh, okay. Uh, the error and the uh, 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 poor methodology is such that it could come out uh, right. Now, the uh, people know that if you have a federal grant and you falsify your data, uh, you can go to jail. But you can put out the data and misinterpret it any way you want. <laughs> so how did they find that the... Uh, actual risk corrected was 1.59. It's not that great, but it's something. And the answer is that uh, they corrected for confounders. Now, what this means is, for example, if you, if you found that there was a direct correlation between, say, carbohydrate and obesity, uh, you would have to recognize that people who took in a lot of carbohydrate might also be taking in a lot of calories. So you would have to correct that data for calories. And if it held up, uh, the association might be causal. If it didn't help hold up, you'd have to throw it out. Uh, however, if you start from something uh, that is wrong and you add confounders, uh, well, they actually, uh, uh, the time-dependent Cox proportional hazard re regression model uh, means they uh, just looked at how uh, uh, the rate changed over time. And they had to correct for race and uh, family history and uh, smoking and uh, uh, red meat and uh, initial and changes in other lifestyle. And uh, uh, they got it to come out right. Probably if, if it hadn't uh, uh, come out right, they'd have to put in a shirt size and uh, 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 other variables. Uh, well, overall, I described this uh, with reference to Gulliver's Travels. He's in a country where they refer to the thing which was not because their language doesn't have a word for lying. Uh, th this is uh, uh, meaningless data. <laughs>
another view of the biological gradient. And this compared, again, changes in uh, availability of uh, uh, sugar with uh, the incidence of diabetes. Now, what's good about this paper is that it actually put out all the data. It did not lump things together, did not give you a mind-numbing uh, uh, table. And uh, the, uh, well, I'll just show you one uh, 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 thing about this is what I did is uh, you have to recognize that uh, here there was no, uh, no change in diabetes, and here there was no change in sugar availability. And uh, uh, what I did is just uh, uh, break this into uh, quarters and colorize it. I haven't changed any of the data here. It, and what you can see is that it's as likely that, uh, well, almost as likely that if you lower sugar, you get an increase in diabetes, or if you increase sugar, you get lower diabetes. So uh, this data really, uh, uh, if anything, it says there's no association. But when you consider that they're measuring changes in sugar uh, availability, uh, you, you know, the whole thing uh, could be changed if uh, uh, a couple of guys in Hoboken uh, hijacked a, a crate of uh, sugar every couple of months. Um, I won't go through these, uh, I'll just post them. Uh, Hill had a total of nine uh, criteria. And, um, uh, well, as I say, I'll just post these. Uh, uh, he, he was very careful about saying, uh, about biological plausibility, that that changes uh, over time. Let me switch now instead to Bayes' theorem. Um, now, uh, have a, uh, I'm going to skip most of the detail to give you the bottom line, which is that Bayes' theorem relates statistics to psychology. It tells you what, what you really mean when you say you have 20% uh, uh, chance of rain. Now, most people interpret that as not meaning anything at all. Uh, it means you know what you knew just before you turned on the radio. Uh, but it recognizes that uh, what you have in uh, statistics is a belief state. And uh, I'll skip through to the, uh, to the bottom line. And uh, well, Bayes, Bayes put it in an equation. Bayes was actually an 18th century a clergyman. This dates from 1743, and he. Uh, what what the equation is? It's one of the uh, odder equations to uh, understand. Is he, he says that you start with an a priori assumption about the likelihood that uh, uh, cardiovascular disease and saturated fat are associated. And then you correct that, in some sense, by the actual experiment that you do about the probability uh, that there's a lot of cardiovascular disease and the probability that the people in your study uh, are uh, actually consuming saturated fat. And then you have an a posteriori uh, conclusion. In other words, you, you have a new uh, belief state based on the experiment. And, uh, in practical terms, you may not be able to put a number on the a priori belief, uh, but that's the likelihood be, uh, for the experiment. So uh, cutting to the uh, conclusion, uh, we, whatever the belief that saturated fat was a causal agent, after the Framingham study, our belief had to go down. We were, we were much more suspicious that that was true, or, or we should have been. And uh, the Oslo Heart Study uh, would uh, further uh, give us a, a belief about the, the hypothesis that was lower than when we started the experiment. And there's a whole bunch of these winding up with the Women's Health Initiative, uh, uh, after which uh, we wouldn't believe it at all. <laughs> 
So what, what, what's the, uh, the take home message here? If you apply this kind of thinking uh, to a meta-analysis, this is where they, uh, people try to average uh, uh, different experiments, uh, you can see that the assumption is very bad. Now, several of these came out recently uh, comparing what happens when you substitute uh, uh, saturated fat for other things. And uh, the remarkable thing, the statistical rule is that if the error bar crosses uh, the uh, uh, hazard ratio of one, then there's no difference. And so there are only two statistically significant uh, studies here. So what should have been is rather than averaging these, each one of these should make the others less likely. Um, and uh, so what, what you're doing in a meta-analysis is you're trying to show that many wrongs add up to something real, and that doesn't make sense. Uh, let me try to finish up by showing you what I think is a good way to present some of the data. And uh, we, we published this a, a couple of years ago. It was based on the idea. We said, well, you know, if you're going to do statistics, the underlying assumption in statistics is that uh, your independent variable, which is what people eat, for example, or, you know, the, the, this is r relatively identical and that the error is due to uh, some kind of random disturbance in the environment that... Uh, uh, one guy gets uh, somewhat more mayonnaise in his tuna fish salad or something. Uh, but we know that that's really not true in a diet experiment. And the uh, uh, twin study shows you uh, that, in fact, uh, if you look at energy efficiency, how many uh, 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 change in energy compared to the predicted, you can see the twins are very close together. But between pairs of twins, there's a lot of variability. Um, so uh, what we did is we tried to take account of this and, and give the, what would be the most modest uh, approach to the diet study. So what we did, this is, we took Volick's data from a low-carb a low diet, very low-carbohydrate uh, ketogenic diet, and a low-fat diet. So the, uh, we, we took the uh, low-carb diet, we uh, took all of the weight loss, and we put them in order and put them across the top. We took the low fat group and put those down the side. And then we took uh, all the differences, and the differences are the individual matrix elements. And so what we're saying here is uh, we don't know whether two people are alike, but let's look at all the possibilities. You know, uh, what, will be, what will happen if one person just happens to be like uh, each of the others? And so this, this is the broadest picture of what could go wrong. And then we color code this, and uh, uh, if, the, uh, if it's evenly divided, then you know there's no real difference between the two diets. Uh, but in fact, you can see that the uh, low-carb diet was drastically better. Uh, more important, I, I don't think you can see the color here, but the people who really did well uh, was much greater uh, in the uh, low-carb group. So we published it. We, uh, we did it because it made sense and it was a good way to look at the data, but we kept saying to each other, we can't have invented this. Somebody must have done something like this before. Uh, uh, we ran into the problem of uh, communicating with statisticians, which turns out to be harder than I thought. Uh, and it took us a, a while before, uh, they, they didn't know what we were talking about. Uh, we finally found what this really is like. And it's like the non-parametric method. Uh, uh, a a non-parametric uh, test is what you do if, if you uh, uh, are not sure that your data is normally distributed, like a bell-shaped curve. And uh, all you do is you, uh, this compares the response time for alcoholics, uh, for alcohol ingestion and uh, placebo and they get all these different times. And all you do is you just uh, rank them. You, you put them in a list. And then you uh, add up uh, all the ranks. And the group that has the higher rank is, in this case, the, the slower one. So it's clear that alcohol uh, uh, has much lower uh, reaction time. And so we realized that this is really equivalent to what we were doing. We made a matrix, and we took put uh, one group on the top, 
the other group on the side, and we uh, calculated all the differences. Then when you color code it, you can immediately see that one group is better than the other. So we're, we're going to call this the uh, graphical non-parametric uh, matrix uh, algorithm on the chance that it's so complicated that people start calling it the uh, Feynman Fine method. Uh, <laughs> and we'll see whether that happens. Uh, so these are the take home messages. Got to see all the data. Uh, statistics always, uh, group statistics always hides uh, data. And it has to be a strong association. And the onus is on the author to convey the reader accurate impression of what the data look like. Uh, otherwise, you've got to view it with suspicion. Uh, okay, that's it. We probably have time for one or two quick questions. Does anyone want to ask Dr. Feynman? Anybody in the back? I can walk to you. Okay. I got to Feynman. So do you disagree with the fact then that fructose creates more fat in a person's body than glucose? Uh, yeah, I disagree with that. As, as a general statement, I mean, and there are certainly conditions where it may. It does not actually contribute to fat. If you, if you actually look at, at what happens, uh, uh, it can contribute to the uh, uh, glycerol backbone. But it... Uh, it's just what I said. It, it can contribute more fat or it can contribute less fat. It depends on everything that's there. I mean, the way I describe metabolism is, is it's like uh, uh, American football. You know, you can follow the quarterback, but the key to the play may be uh, downfield blocking or what everybody's doing. Uh, you, you can't make a, a statement like that. Sometimes it increases fat, sometimes it decreases fat. But most of all, the, the main take-in point here is that the data supporting the unique effect of fructose comes from uh, studies where you have a high background carbohydrate. And the question is not, should we convert, should we change uh, some fructose in our diet to glucose? The question is, if we do that, is that comparable to taking out carbohydrate across the board and replacing it with fat? Which is better, replace carbohydrate with fat, keep carbohydrate high, and replace uh, fructose with glucose? Uh, experiment hasn't been done. Why not? Uh, well, uh, I don't think they want to know the answer. Well, you know the answer. Uh, well, uh, Hill pointed out, you never really know the answer until you do the experiment. But I think we know, yeah. That's, that's all the time we have. Uh, please join me in thanking Dr. Feynman. Our next talk will start at 11 o'clock.